Why everyone need a living revocable trust? Hello, I'm attorney Thomas Burton, and if that sounds like an article I wrote, you would be wrong. While I agree with the general sentiment, this is actually a blog post written by the financial educator and planner Susie Orman. Why everyone needs a living revocable trust. This topic came up when I've had certain people, clients mention Susie Orman and they saw her program on PBS discussing why she feels people should use a revocable living trust, avoid probate, and provide for the distribution of their assets after their death. And I actually was watching this program one night several years ago when I saw Susie come on and she told her story about her mother's house, small house in California, that had appreciated over the years and was worth several hundred thousand dollars at her death. But Susie, I believe, said she spent over $10,000, something like that, to get the house transferred to her and sold. I believe Susie was the only heir. But it was her first brush with the probate court system, and California is notorious for having high probate court expenses and fees, but in every state, it generally involves time, expense, and delay. So I'm going to read you a few excerpts from her short blog post here, because I feel sometimes on the channel, you hear me talk about revocable living trust, but my day job is as an attorney, so I see lots of cases that have convinced me why it's better to avoid probate in the vast majority of instances. But this is Susie Orman. Her day job is not an attorney. Her day job is giving people financial advice and she's generally a very frugal person, encourages people to save and invest their money. In response to several emails and tweets asking why a trust is so mandatory, Orman spells it out. A living revocable trust serves as far more than just where your assets are to go upon your death and it does that in an efficient way, she said. Unlike a will, a living trust also covers you while you are still alive, Orman noted. You must think about what if something happens and you become ill and incapacitated. Who is going to take care of you and pay your bills, Orman asked. A key difference between a will and a living revocable trust is that the living trust has an incapacity clause that states who you want to sign for your affairs in the event you are unable to do so yourself. So she hits on a very key point here, and it's one I've talked about before. But a trust protects you not only after death, but also during life because it provides for that incapacity protection. And essentially what it does is it names a successor trustee who can step into your shoes if you are in that health condition, incapacitated, unable to act. But they can also step back out of your shoes when you recover and you assume powers of trustee. So what I like about using a revocable living trust, or a living revocable trust, as Susie calls it, it means the same thing. It just means it's a trust you set up during life. It's revocable by you and changeable by you until death. Only after death does it become irrevocable because you don't want your trustee or your heirs to be able to change your wishes after you're gone. But what I like about it is it provides for this incapacity protection. And I think in the public awareness, sometimes the public and attorneys have focused on avoiding probates because that is a really big benefit to a revocable living trust, avoiding the time, expense, and probate court fees by using a trust. But sometimes we've given short shrift to how it can provide this incapacity protection. And that's what I like how Susie says here, who is going to take care of you and pay your bills if you're ill and incapacitated? So she's thinking holistically about you in your life and we know from statistics as people are living longer, more people are going to experience periods of incapacity, whether due to health or mental conditions such as Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that. So they're going to be alive for several years, but they aren't dead. A will only takes a effect upon your death. So really a will is only planning for your physical assets after you're gone, whereas a revocable trust provides total life planning, both during life and after death. We can use one document to do everything. Instead of needing separate documents during life and separate after life, the trust sets up after death. The, set, the trust starts during life and continues after your death and can manage all of your assets. Now the key with using a trust plan is to make sure assets are properly titled into the name of your trust because generally no one is planning to be incapacitated, but if you wake up one day in that coma after a car wreck, you will be glad that your bank account is already in the name of the trust, the title to your house, your business, and other assets, because 
trust law has been around for hundreds of years. So I have experienced this with bank trust departments. They're the most, banks in general are the most comfortable dealing with a trustee under a trust. There, you can use a financial power of attorney as an agent, but because trusts have been around hundreds of years going back to England, banks, we have more case law and more precedent on what a trustee can do under a trust than even what an agent can do under a financial power of attorney. So if you want to give your age, your uh, trustee, your person you trust, the most authority and the easiest time acting for you, generally you want to use a trust to do this. One other thing Orman says in this little blog post is be mindful of the key difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. An irrevocable trust cannot be modified or terminated without permission of the beneficiary. Once the grantor transfers the asset into the irrevocable trust, he or she removes all rights of ownership to the trust and assets, Orman explains. So that's a simplified explanation, but she's generally right. And so the type of trust she's talking about and most of us estate planners talk about as the most common is a revocable living trust, meaning a trust you can amend or change entirely while you're alive, similar to how you can change your will as long as you're alive. But the great thing about a trust is there's even less formalities required to change or amend your trust than with a will where you need the two disinterested witnesses every time you sign a codicil or change your will completely. A trust, you can simply execute an amendment. And in Wisconsin, it only requires your signature, but I generally recommend signing it in front of a notary public when possible. And this is often very easy to do because notary publics are available at a variety of banks, financial institutions, government, courthouses. So while it can be more difficult to find two witnesses and properly do all the steps of a will signing, it's generally even easier to find a notary public to witness you sign an amendment to your trust. So that's just one bonus example of how a trust can be more flexible to use uh, to amend or change once it's in place. So that's Susie Orman's answer on why everyone needs a revocable, a living revocable trust, revocable living trust. And I believe she makes some very good points there. And I thought it would be useful to you to watch because this is someone else, a financial person giving their opinion on the topic and not an attorney. Because I'm aware that people think attorneys want to, um, some attorneys do trust because Generally, trust costs more to set up than a will, and the attorney makes money from that. And that is true. An attorney makes money from set, drawing up whatever documents you want. But Susie Orman, who is frugal and a budgeting lady and a saving and investing lady, she's looking at your total picture. And if setting up a trust makes sense to her, it probably makes good financial advice for you. Again, depending on your mix of assets and your goals. So if you have significant assets, the more assets you have, often the more a trust can save you in time, expense, and delay of probate court. So I hope this video has been helpful to you. If it has, please consider giving it a like so others can see and benefit from this information as well. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.